So, if common to both uh, the for-profits and not-for-profits is the, uh, the the goal of remaining sustainable. I, I, we had a cap and trade conference here uh, a couple of years ago through the College of the Environment, and I remember someone say saying, you know, my definition of a sustainable organization is one that has a profit every year, so I can I can keep doing the work I do for climate right. change because I'm actually also returning money to my investors, and if I didn't return any profit to my investors. I would be in big trouble. But also, if I didn't do any the climate change good work, I would also be in trouble. So Absolutely. I, I, your point is, is really well taken, that, that this is a, a, a much more bl- a blurry area. And I suppose that's why social entrepreneurship has become charismatic for people, because people who like that ambiguity or like the opportunity to do, to do good in the world uh, while, while also um, running an organization that, um, that uh, is sustainable and, and, and supporting, <laughs> right. support, financially well, supporting its, also, its members. I, I guess in a reassuring way. So when I was teaching high school, you always get these kind of comments of like, you know, you're not in the real world. Yeah, Business right, is right, like right. the real world. And I remember John Fullerton, who used to be the managing director of J.P. Morgan, stood up at a conference of social entrepreneurs, impact investing. And he said, I finally woke up and joined the real world. And that was, a, it, was a, it was a, it was probably about 10, eight years ago, and uh-huh. I still remember that feeling, because I think there is a way in which, I don't think the social entrepreneurs are making something blurry. I think they're naming what already was, was blurry. blurry. Yeah, that's a great point. And they're naming the truth. So yeah. if you feel crazy, in your instinct to say it could be different and and these lines don't make sense to me the lines don't make sense the lines are set up for people to have guidelines right. to the, they're set up by the people who make the rules right so if <laughs> so, you want to change rules i really so don't want to change them yeah. don't say wow you know your rules don't make sense to me i must be wrong well their rules might very well be completely insane yeah in this field we talked a little bit uh, before about the the typical image of the entrepreneur being a male. Yeah. Uh, and I know uh, that for, me, for many social impact investors and for many people engaged in uh, social entrepreneurship, they find th- the greatest potential for change is investing in women yeah. and um, being gender conscious activists or gender conscious investors sure. or both. Right. And what, what, how, how, what have you found in that regard? I mean, how, how is gender f- factored into your work? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a girl, so that's been interesting all the way through. I was once in a room, which was a leadership of impact investing, kind of a who's who, and I looked around the room about halfway into the meeting. I realized I was the only woman in the room, mm-hmm. and that's still common. I was also the only, um, I, was, I was the only woman, and there weren't any people of color. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that we've failed in part mm-hmm. in the social entrepreneurship movement is that it has had an elite element to mm-hmm. it. It has been, you know, it came in some ways, a lot of it was driven out of the, the dot-com boom, right? Mm-hmm. That was really part of the explosion. And this kind of sense of these sort of clever tech folks yes. <laughs> who were like, we can flip a switch and change the world. Yeah. And it came often from a point of pleasure, a, a point of privilege mm-hmm. where we can do that faster and better than all of these slow community based mm-hmm. organizations. So it was interesting. So if you take that as like 2001, 2000, 2004, 2005, mm-hmm. at the same time, you have the growth of microfinance. Right. Which really was about saying there are entrepreneurs all over the world or there's people at least in this case who you know meaning that they want to own their own destinies yes right they're not looking for a job they're not mm-hmm. looking for a handout they yeah. actually would be happy to build their own enterprise within their community and <laughs> apparently to everybody's surprise many of those were women <laughs> just like part of me just is like i think the story about microfinance is just endlessly amusing because people are sort of shocked that women are the ones who would return capital. Well, one, that that makes sense in all kinds of ways in terms of women's position in society. The other reality about microfinance and Mm microbusiness across the world is most of the people in poverty are women. So it's kind of like saying, if I work in jails in the United States, I have a race lens and I understand race because most of the people Mm -hmm. in jails are African American. That doesn't, right? So there's a kind of weird logic that says, well, you're just going to find a lot of women in poverty and they don't want to be there. So if you give them an opportunity to find their way out, they will. Entrepreneurship overall has not been something that's easy 
mm -hmm. for us to see women in that position. Right. And therefore, it's not been easy for women to see themselves right. in that position. And that then gets reinforced by questions of access to capital. I think we're still at 3% of the venture capital in the United States goes to women. Mm -hmm. But the microfinancing and the kind of international use of that tool has, as you said, I mean, it, 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 it has really focused on women as, as the kind of um, where the greatest impact happens, I mean, that is that... Uh, Initially it did. It's yeah. now shifting. Mm -hmm. um, as microfinance becomes small to medium enterprises mm -hmm. or SME financing, mm -hmm. it's now shifting back so it's less predominantly women. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated picture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we also went, we went a little bit too far mm -hmm. with the, a woman has a cow, and that's the picture of mm -hmm. the future of the universe. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's not important, mm -hmm. and there have been huge advancements. Mm -hmm. um, not all of them were good for women. Right. But I, I guess I mean, this, this is, um, it's as really I was about to say, it must be, it must be <laughs> over, well, really uh, oversimplifying things. But uh, o often when something is good for a man, it's good for that man. And often when something is good for a woman, it's good for a lot of other people around the woman. Is that is that is that more uh, is that is that f f fair enough? I mean, not as an not as a universal, but as a probability. If you're because investors deal with probability, right? That if you're going to have an effect on more people, you're likely to do it more likely to do it through women than through men. Yes. I'm going to stick with that's an oversimplification. <laughs> it's clearly, you know, it's, clearly that's always is. true, no matter what anybody says. So, so here's the interesting <laughs> thing. What we talk about in gender lens investing right now right. is to think about how do you think about gender and, in, and investing with a gender lens mm -hmm. that, that you look through an opportunity, right. that it's as opportunity, right. not a screen. Absolutely. And so much of actually mm -hmm. how we've approached things is to say we should get to 30% or 50%, mm -hmm. we should get past 18%, mm -hmm. which is where women are often stuck. Right. We should move from a screen to seeing women as an opportunity. Right. When I started working on gender lens investing across the board, inside of social entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. impact investors said, it is hard enough for us to do our work. We couldn't also have a gender lens because we would make our opportunity set mm -hmm. even smaller. Mm -hmm. Women who are over 50% of yeah, the population- so it becomes a filter rather than an opportunity. Become yeah. a niche market really yeah. quickly. <laughs> and yeah. that happens because of gender norms in our society. Yeah, yeah. And so social entrepreneurship overall, mm -hmm. social entrepreneurship has not been a movement mm -hmm. that uh, bolstered women's leadership. Right. It basically said, look, we need to take the style of entrepreneurship that we know, mm -hmm. which is all out, run fast, run hard, mm. get to you know the hockey stick as quickly mm. as possible mm -hmm. and make a lot of money. And so I talk to a lot of you know uh, um, investors who say, well, you know, I I would invest in a woman, but you know, what if they have kids, and what if they have a family, and I just don't see the same mm, I see. drive. Mm. The monomaniacal. The monomaniacal, <laughs> and I'm sort of like, wow. And that's the image they still yeah. want. Yeah, I see. Even the best of them. Mm -hmm. They want that, I can sacrifice everything for that single cause. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that's a bad idea. Yeah. I don't think that's how we can change For the men world. Or women, yeah. I, I just think that's a dumb business yeah, idea. Yeah, right. Right? And so if you want to make sure that an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> if you want to make sure that an entrepreneur is stable mm -hmm. and can stay focused on the business, build daycare into the uses of capital in your investment. Right. Say, you know what? We're going to make sure mm -hmm. that you have health care and daycare mm -hmm. because that enables you to be focused, whether you're a man right. or a woman. Right. Let's actually figure out how do we not just adopt the mm -hmm. rules. This is where I think social entrepreneurship and impact investing has at many times gone very wrong. Mm -hmm. We took all the rules of how we did yes. business before and said we'll use the rules of business and just direct them towards mm -hmm. changing the world. Mm -hmm. And then we have all these unintended yeah. consequences. Consequences yeah. of oh well we've got uh, monomaniacal entrepreneurs who are overly arrogant driving right. too fast and don't seem to actually be paying attention to their unintended consequences. Right. 
I see the, 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 the point about not getting fooled into um, uh, thinking of a gender lens as somehow reducing your ability to either do business or to do, do good in the world. Uh, I, I, mean, I know some projects that are really focused on educating women because that, that will have a, these strong reverberations. But um, uh, w women also uh, are, are the ones who suffer most from illiteracy. In, in, right. So it's the biggest opportunity in terms of if you want to have impact, you'll find more women to educate. I mean, it's a big market. If you're working on victims of violence, you'll find a lot of women as well, Remarkable. right? So it's just, and so, people in poverty and all of those things. So, so you're, you're cautioning me not to feel too good about these opportunities <laughs> because these are opportunities born out of the, the pain and problems that, that we have, right? Thanks, everyone. Good evening, people. Special shout out to all the people who came from Africa, not those who go to Africa and come back, but those who actually <laughs> came from Africa and especially those who are going back like myself this evening. I'll tell you my name in four minutes, and I'll tell you why I'll tell you my name after I finish speaking. I want to talk about the things that spur entrepreneurs, the things we are dealing with on a daily basis, and the things we are looking forward to. The first issue is education. If I run a company, it's because I am qualified to run a company and to sell services. And so for us, entrepreneurship, innovation must come through education because I've got one and, and I'm working that so that other young people can get adequate education. I've studied a lot of things and I'm still studying. I believe that education is one key factor in innovation. Opportunity is another way of educating person because once you get the head knowledge, you need the hand knowledge, you need hands on. So when we get more opportunities to showcase our experiences, then we get a shot at failure and that helps us to do better. I've been given opportunities and I'm also working to give opportunities to people. I have some of the slides up here, but I want to share with us what some people are doing. We have young people who are innovating in birth management. Um, one of the pictures there shows an ordinary jerry can, this 40, 40 liter water conservers. They just cut it into two and build a complete server inside it. Open holes around the corner to, to give air. And when you look at it, it just looks like an ordinary 40 liter jerry can, but that's a server that runs on Ubuntu and can do a lot of things. There's a young man who is helping parents in rural areas register births, announce births of their baby girls by sending an SMS. And that is very important. Um, we need to talk about mentoring. I've been mentored by older people, by those who came there before me, and young people also need to be mentored. I have published surveys, I've done a lot of research on what young people need the most. Funding is number two, it is not number one. Mentoring is number one. Then we need to talk about internationalization, not the Linux one, but giving a louder voice to what people are doing. And that is the only reason I came here today, to say this, that a whole lot is happening in Africa in all the areas of economic life. We cannot be innovative enough unless we have openness. Openness in technology standards, openness in procurement, level playing grounds, open government, open data, open source software, because that's where I come from. Were it not for open source software, I couldn't be an entrepreneur in technology. Then the internet. We cannot do anything today without a robust internet connection. I would like to say thank you to everyone who is working so that Africa gets connected and affordably. I will now tell you my name. And that is my identity. 
And that is the one thing you should not forget. When I was born in March, I never got a name until June because my mother had had a first girl, a second girl, and this one. And they said, no, we don't want girls. You could go away. We're not taking this one. And so they kept calling me baby until my father came back after his studies and said, I'll keep the baby. And he called me his mother. That's the meaning of my name, Nena. So whenever you pronounce that name, you must breathe in, breathe out, and smile. Nena. Thank you, Nena. Thank you so much. Um. I think the key that the the key then is to think about how do you use knowledge about gender yes. to come up with better solutions, and that's where do you have. Um, are you really listening mm -hmm. to what women want? Yeah. There's an amazing woman who um, started a company in India, and she she thought, you know what I'm going to do? I, I just I finally I'm going to address this cool access to education thing, and I'm going to send I'm going to sell sanitary pads yeah. in in rural villages. Mm -hmm. And she started wandering around and 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 came up with a good product and and said, this is access to education. We all yeah. know that this works. Menstruation's a huge issue. And the women said, I really would like a blender. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, well, why do you want a blender? Because actually my, the relationship with my mother-in-law is really tense because I have to spend so much time chopping. And if I had a blender, I could have more freedom in my day in food preparation and not have to spend as much yes. time with my mother-in-law. So I would like a blender. <laughs> right? And so actually this woman shifted her company and now does sort of market research at the bottom of the pyramid oh, to say, what do women actually want? Another thing right now is we're seeing lots of innovations on mobile devices. Yes. And everybody's saying, oh, great, this is a way to get health information right, right. into the hands. Oh, okay, we have to be careful because mm -hmm. mobile devices, overall, people are counting how many mobile devices are owned by a family. Right. All right, you've got gender issues then. Is actually the mobile device owned by the family accessible to the woman? Mm -hmm. And for what period of time? Yes. And then they say, oh, no, no, we've got that solved. We'll go to internet cafes. Okay, are internet cafes right. actually accessible to women? So ostensibly, we have to really be aware of gender dynamics in context yes. and say, I could actually solve for those problems, right. not just say, my cool device will yeah. also help women magically. Right. I mean, women's economic participation in the economy is growing in the next 10 years equal to India and China, I'm sorry, India and China combined. Hmm. Right? It's a massive economic trend. And we're responding with something similar to pink laptops. We are not mm -hmm. actually... We should be doing blenders. We should be we listening should, to what people... We should be listening yeah. and actually paying... But one of the really interesting things is gender studies programs, people who know gender, yeah. come from a somewhat Marxist background. Mm -hmm. right? Gender studies traditionally in the mm -hmm. academy, really interestingly, the people who know gender are not showing up mm -hmm. in conversations about finance and entrepreneurship. See. They're sort of stepping back and saying, I don't trust that world. Mm -hmm. And there are still less than 3% of the asset managers in the world are women. So, so um, the, the listening to women, trying to understand what problem you're solving for, I mean, these become, not, these become good practices, whether right. you're, you're focused on gender or you're, you're focused on other forms of social oh, entrepreneurship. And, and, or any sort of basic structural inequity. Yeah. When you're dealing with somebody who's been left out of the system, Listen. don't assume that the system is actually really organized for them. Yeah. So, uh, it, you know, there are a lot of people taking this course, it's called uh, How to Change the World, who are looking for ways to get involved, to, to looking for ways to, to make a difference. What, what kind of things that would you tell people who are, you know, they're trying to find ways to participate uh, with organizations or create organizations that will uh, make a positive contribution? I guess it's, it's twofold. One is, it's actually your place to do it. Mm -hmm. Right? This isn't somebody else's. It's the same thing back to political activism. Right. When we step back and said, actually, it isn't just one group of people who run the government. Right. This is actually, in many, in many countries in the world, entrepreneurship and this kind of social activism is a way to move in society that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one is, whoever it is, 
it's actually your place, your to, place do it. to do it. Yeah. It isn't the MBAs of the world. Anybody can do this. Right. I mean, I was a high school teacher and <laughs> go for heaven's sake. And then, and then the second thing is it is your place and it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think there's a sense of it's daunting. We want to create support mechanisms. But you can't expect this is actually the hard stuff. It is risky. It is risky. It's doubly hard because you're both trying to create a sustainable endeavor Mm -hmm. and actually create sustainable change. Yeah. Doing that, doing both is actually twice as hard. Yeah. And so give yourself some space to fail. Well, thank you so much. I think you've you, you've increased the, uh, the the possibilities that the that the folks will have spaces for success as well. And 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 uh, I'm I'm grateful that you took the time to talk with me today. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much.